All right, it's Jeff Mayhew, it's John Beatty, it's Politics and Parenting, where we talk about politics, but we talk about it differently. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jeff, uh, but as one of my college professors used to say, the vacation is over. I gotta go back to, <laughs> gotta go back to reality tomorrow, so. Go back to reality. Uh, reality's rough, isn't it? Yeah, but that's also the thing about vacations is that you actually, you can't take a break for anything. You got uh, children, you've got uh, house jobs, you've got uh, maybe a school board job that has multiple meetings that week that you had to go through. So um, yes, it was a, a time off from my day-to-day -day activities, but uh, the phone still went out and I still had to figure out some way to get them back on. So uh, there's very few rests for the weary. How are you doing? I'm good. You know, same. I don't, I don't have a, <clears throat> we don't get spring break where I work, but it's uh, we do do a lot of work with the schools, so it's a little bit less. But because <laughs> you've got one of those like real jobs where you have to like really really do something, and I I just tech support for. Yeah, <laughs> I mean I don't know like what is a real job anymore? Like I feel like I like I don't even know what I do. I'm just like I'm all these different places doing all these different things. It's like do I do anything really? Well, that's the weird thing. Like if a politician talks about like I'm gonna bring twenty thousand million jobs to this area. You know, if someone was was running for a Manassas City Council and said, I'm going to bring 100,000 jobs to Manassas, you'd be like, this guy's crazy. Um, because like, yeah, what does it even mean? I, I mean, like, I mean, I'm so I'm a knowledge worker in a particular sense. Like I don't do a whole lot with my hands other than like pushing the power button on and off to switch servers on and on. Um, but my trick, my like my training, if you will, was computer science, which is a very. Um, very um, cerebral or, you know. I, no, I wouldn't say cerebral because it, it can be very rote. And I mean, it's it's no, for me, it's no different than someone who it does does plumbing, um, except instead of having to use a welder and uh, cut pipe, I just type on a keyboard and um, people's lives go on. And you know, it, it's it, funny it that sense. you you make that comparison. I talk to people all the time, like, you know, I call myself blue collar, right? Mm -hmm. You're blue collar too, like, but people don't think of you as blue collar. Right. They think of that. And you like you just you just made the comparison yourself from your job to somebody else's job. That's blue collar. These white collar tech jobs. It's just. If you're the machine that in the car, you know, one of the cogs in the machine, then you're that's blue collar, isn't it? Kind of. I mean, it's it's certainly uh, it's not like the factories they had 120, 130 years ago where they were. Um, pulling molten steel and people would fall into the vats and they would die. Um, like we had this discussion on the uni, like the, so the Loudoun County school board just voted to unionize teachers. And I don't, I don't think teachers need to be unionized, but uh, one of the thoughts, one of the things that I thought about is like the history of the union movement, like people were in really bad working conditions. Like, yeah. Um, a, they had terrible hours. B, they were in cramped uh, locations. They had, uh, bad lighting they had bad ventilation like we figured out a lot of things and i would say like factory workers have a lot of and then there's sort of um actual laws and stuff like osha and labor laws and things like like i don't think union is unions uh do as much for their their workers as they do and i would say maybe one caveat to that is something like electric going back to like plumbers and electricians like where you're kind of this weird sort of individuals all competing with each other in mm -hmm. order to service something. Um, and I think maybe unionization makes a little sense in that, but that's, again, that's really just like price setting and sort of trying to figure out what's the best way for the, everyone provides a quality service, but also, um, you know, can compete a little bit with each other. But um, I, it's, it's a little weird, but I mean, you listen to these uh, Facebook people who, people at Facebook and Google who just got laid off and they're like, yeah, I got paid uh, $400,000 to, to literally do nothing. And, um, you know, that's, sad honestly it is it is it is sad um yeah i mean <clears throat> like my wife does it and you know I, she works like 14 15 hours a day right like she doesn't really have much choice uh she clocks in she clocks out um that's that's like working in the factories yeah. you know so she gets to get she get you know the benefits she gets to do it from the comfort of her home most days she does have to go to the office sometimes but you know i mean i think like the difference between like being blue collar or anything else is choice and time, yeah. right? You know, choice and time is is always the things. It's 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 not money. You know, people put qualifications. You can be blue collar and have like be a plumber 
make $200,000 a year and save a ton of money. But, and then eventually you'll retire and you'll have all that time, but you know, you may work 20 years for it and you may work hard for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, in fact, we need more people doing that, honestly. Um, but it's not the same as, I don't know, the the other circle of life, you know, the politicians, the media stars, the entertainment, you know, where it's like, yeah, you know, but, it, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. No, that's an interesting thing about money. Like, uh, I remember my brother went to this school, Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. It's right on the Ohio River. And apparently at some point it was like the glitziest city in Eastern America. Like I think it, I don't, I don't know if it was rivaling uh, Las Vegas at the time, but it was on par of terms of like, they had uh, the amenities, the fancy hotels, the nightlife and stuff. But now it's just this decrepit old town that kind of once the steel industry moved on or um, uh, it had a lot of issues, but, but the, the, like those were blue collar people and doing blue collar work, but some of them were very well off, and that was one of like the promises of of uh, the American economy was that you could you could do a blue collar job, you could raise a family, and your wife could be a homemaker, and uh, your kids could go off to college, and you could pay for college out of pocket, uh, mm -hmm. and you know like it's just it's a like going back to like what is a job anyway? It's like it's such a different world now, yeah. where you you almost need like both spouses working um, if you're yep. going to live in this area. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean. <laughs> Like, what is a job? <laughs> uh, yeah. So we got a meeting coming up, John, this Saturday. Are you excited for it? Very excited. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll what are we there. talking about? We're talking about the sphere of power. This is like, if there's one thing that uh, is the quintessential Jeff Mayhew thing for the campaign, it's the sphere of power. You got it. <laughs> Back when he had his long hair and he'd bring his Madison, his um, Federalist papers and he had this little, like like a preacher, someone pulling out the Bible, reading <laughs> some verses. Like it was... That was Jeff Mayhew that I remember from the campaign. And, uh, <laughs> Are you saying that I'm not the same Jeff Mayhew anymore? I'm a different. No, Jeff, but know? that was my first introduction to Jeff Mayhew, and it it fit a, a particular persona that uh, you know you're just you're trying to preach the good news almost. I mean, I'm just trying to share some information that's out that's there right. that everybody could benefit from, you know. Mm -hmm. So well, um, we've got. For our, we do a little introductions of ourselves each time, and this time we chose to do our powers. I got this uh, idea from Craig. It's like a almost like a team building exercise. I think we called it originally like our superpowers and weaknesses mm -hmm. or kryptonite or whatever. And since we're doing the sphere of power and we're talking about all the different powers of the government and society, we figure like, what's our power, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's let's dive into that, John. What's your power? Or wait, I'm supposed to read yours, aren't I? You're supposed to read it, yeah. Let me read John's. John knows the long arc of history is bunk. We put on the same play every few generations, just with different props. Our current act is one we've seen before, with division, discontent, and discourse only to those on our team. He wants to rework the script to make our society better, and and in this bent we're on that's only go going to lead to tragedy. I read yours, right? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I checked the name afterwards. Uh, so, so I think uh, I, I th if I was to put it in a nutshell, I just like um, I've I've kind of I've studied history and I've studied a lot of history, and I think um, I know a lot more than a lot of people. Not probably not as much as you, and actually no, definitely not as much as you. But but like that's uh, that's missing so much in our political discourse. It's sort of this we're so focused on the here and now the What's the, what's the Twitter du jour, fight du jour that everyone's talking about? What's the 24-hour media cycle? What's the seven-week media cycle? Um, and we just kind of lose context for like, what the heck's going on in the world? And the fact that we've we've been, we've been around for uh, millions and millions of years on this planet, and there's a lot of collective wisdom that we could actually kind of bring in to our discourses and be like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so I, like, I, I try to be a little poetic in there, but like the long arc of history is something that progressives like to talk about. And probably Barack Obama is the one guy that comes to mind the most who would talk about the arc of history is bending towards this. But I think I want to say he was aping off of Martin Luther King Jr. and probably a lot of people before him. Um, so that's just this idea that like there's this trajectory and we're just, you know, almost like we're players in a play mm -hmm. and we have no control of what we're doing. And I think that's so false. Like we're actually, we have agency and we have free will and we can make decisions right. and stuff. Um, 
But then the history is bunk. This was the saying by uh, Henry Ford, one of your Henry favorite Ford. magnets. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember just having this discussion about it in an eighth grade history class. And um, just kind of, I, if I recall, like the idea was that history can seem so rote and it can seem so silly because we're just memorizing dates and facts. But um, there's, it just, it is uh, our story that, that came before us. And once you realize that and you say like humans actually don't change a lot, even though the, the different setting, you know, we're, we're a American Republic, not a Roman Republic. Um, we're uh, a family uh, that's prosperous and we're in the midst of a boom time of technology, as opposed to a boom time a hundred years ago with um, industrialization. Like there's a lot of similar problems and talking about like, what's a job? Like uh, we had this fight a hundred years, 150 years ago, about like, what is job? What is what do we owe workers? What does society owe workers? What does the company owe workers? Anyway, I think we're going to see the same sort of issue now is everything gets automated or, or many things get automated. It kind of becomes like, what do you owe someone who you've uh, removed their livelihood? Is it a universal basic income? Is it job training so they can find something else because we think that work is dignified and they should do something else? So like, I just think like that's missing in our conversations. Instead, it's something like, oh, We've got AI, man. It can answer all our questions and it's going to be so great. But we're not really thinking about like, what are the knock on effects of this? And I I, I think like that's that's something that I, I want to bring to the conversation. That uh, uh, And that's why I, I agree so much with you. Like history is so important and there's so much to learn because we can uh, short circuit a lot of our need to rethink everything and, and reinvent everything. Yeah, I mean, so first your powers, right? I think you missed I, you missed one of your greatest powers, John. So when I speak to John, one of the things that I always find fascinating is like, we went, we, we had the podcast last week, I talked about the communication packet. And it just that's just a conversation we had. A week later, we're having dinner on Friday night. And I'm trying to re explain something that I wrote. Okay, I can't like do it. And John's like, got it down better than I so like, John processes information very fast. And then can reprocess it out very fast. That's a, that's a great that's a great power, John. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that. No, I'm not very quick on my feet. It's more I just sort of it's the melancholic part of my personality comes in. I just sit in something and stew on it. So um. <laughs> yeah, but like still to to take something like that when I when I speak to most people and I use the terms active and passive in two separate ways to describe communication, I get glaze right. But you mm -hmm. come back with explaining it back to me, you know, really. And I'm like, and that makes, that makes my life easier. Cause uh, what do I say all the time? I don't believe anything until somebody's like, tells me like confirms it. I need like outside sourcing, you know, I can, anything's real in my head. Right. But what's real in reality. <laughs> well, the, the, honestly, that goes back to my, my blue collar roots, roots, Jeff, where being in it and having to do the help desk stuff. Um, naturally people are kind of like, usually people feel kind of stupid because like, I'll go in there and I'll just click a couple of buttons and like whatever it was will work. And so I, I like to sort of be the therapist a little bit and sort of be like, no, 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 let me explain it to you. It's, it's terrible. You know, it could be terribly complicated things, but I'm trying to like break it down to your level. So that's just the practice I've had in, in trying to, again, talk about objects and ideas that literally glaze people's eyes over, you know, you try to <laughs> explain networking or um, how the, the CPU works. And uh, so I, that's that's just where that where that all comes from yeah um so you mentioned something in there about henry ford and like and i i remember reading his biography and that phrase really stuck out to me history is bunk i like all i got is like just this really grumpy old man walking around saying history is bunk you know to everything he disagrees with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um which i found fascinating but he's not wrong in a lot of ways is he you know like what is history? What is real? What isn't real? I mean, it's really hard to to figure out if you don't like really dive into it. Like I talk about all the time, like how I read history is I read about the event mm -hmm. through people. Yeah. And I read about them from a bunch of different people. And by layering all those stories together, you can kind of piece out what really happened here. Because everybody's got their own bent to the argument and they're writing it for Mm -hmm. prosperity's sake they're right writing it to you know get what they want you know there's lots of different reasons people write things and so by layering those all together 
you know, you kind of figure it out. And if you're somebody like his, Henry Ford living in the time frame that he is, maybe information is less, you know, accessible to people. So yeah, you have like the history that you can find. Mm -hmm. but is that history real, you know? Right. And especially if you think about uh, education, we tend to think of just history as teaching dates and names and places and stuff. But when you do what you do, or you try to get the, the get the facts from a bunch of different perspectives, you come up with a whole better understanding of what actually happened on. And you can kind of, you know, going back to like understanding humanity, like you're like, oh, yeah, you know, there were things outside of people's control. There were things that just happened uh, that we can't deal with. And they, this guy got lucky. And then look at him. Uh, I mean, like you think about Alexander Hamilton, like he becomes the treasurer, the secretary of the treasury and one of the most important people in the in the Washington administration. But he's just a guy from uh, what's the uh, I can't think of the the lines in the song and stuff, but he's just like a guy from the Caribbean. Like he got lucky. He was rep he was recognized as a the clerk. He gets sent to King's College in New York City and then meets the right people. And boom, he's he's got this whole trajectory set up and like a you can't plan about that. And I think that's so much of what we try to do is we try to like plan on things. We try to like, Oh, if I could just do X, Y, and Z, but like in reality, you never know. Yeah. I don't think that, uh, I think Alexander didn't think he got lucky. I think Alexander didn't think he earned everything he got. <laughs> sure. But it, it's probably because he didn't study history, Jeff. That's uh, yeah. If he would have, he would have yeah. seen his own ending coming. Wouldn't he have? Yeah. <laughs> No, so. I, he did. He did study history, though. He studied history a lot. Let's be fair. <laughs> he just he studied the wrong people. He was the guy that was a fan of Caesar. It didn't end well for Caesar, did it, Alexander? No. It didn't end well for you either. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's uh, enough about me. Let's talk about you. So Jeff's power is derived from his faith, his family, and friend circle strengthen it. Jeff was gifted. The ability to think all day, feel others' pain, focus on information and solutions, and communicate it all clearly and concisely with passion. The powers gifted to Jeff are voice, focus, empathy, and thought. It's a lot of stuff. Did, did I read that right? I was just making you did. the right guy too. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> this so, is I mean, like, tell me about it. You were just saying like you have trouble communicating and stuff, but obviously, you you see that like. You're bringing something to the table, at the very least. Well, I mean, I used to have a lot of trouble communicating. I am much better now. Um, it, it's not as, you know, I think, uh, and this is what I mentioned by like my family, my friend circle, strengthen it. Maybe I've always been good at like one type of communication, but by listening to those around me, I've learned how to communicate to in different ways. Um, and that's been a really big asset over the last couple of years for me. Um, especially when you're, you know, like you're reading all the layers of history and you're like trying to take all those layers and piece it down into like sentences for people to understand what you're talking about. Um, it has been difficult, uh, but you know, it is something that I hear back from people, you know, people in the community will come up to me and be like, Hey, you know, like I just had a guy today, really nice guy. I've known him for a couple of years. He just came up to me and he goes, you know, I don't say this a lot, but your public speaking has gotten so good over the last year. There you go. <laughs> He goes, it's really impressive. Like, he's like, and it's not like you were bad a year ago. He's like, but you've gotten really good. And I'm like, thanks. You're like the third person to tell me that this week. That's cool. This must be working, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's kind of like if you were, uh, you know, a football player, like you put all the work in, you want to be able to like, am I getting the results? Because you can't, like I tell people all the time, you can't see yourself. You have no idea if you're doing good or bad. You need partners and people around you to tell you. Um, so I keep on hearing that back. And you know, I look at, I look at power as a responsibility, right? And I look, you know, my empathy is something that I've, I've always had the ability to feel other, others pain. It's not a great one to, to carry around a lot, but it does allow me to see perspectives that maybe some might miss. And I take that as a responsibility, you know, to be, and then to use the voice to communicate the gaps, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to help, you know, disagreements and family arguments or, you know, or societal ones, whatever they may be. Um, so it's, and then the focus. Now, this is something that I've grown up with, but avoided, right? The ability to like hyper-focus on something is something that I've always pushed away because I always feel trapped. Like whenever I get hyper-focused on something, literally the world around me disappears. And I kind of, 
I feel bad because maybe I ignore people I care about, or maybe I just don't want to do the thing that I'm getting hyper focused on, right? Like mm -hmm. it's just not a passion of mine. But it is something that once I learned how to communicate with my family better and how to like harness this power, if you will, in mm -hmm. the right direction to limit it, you know, set uh, set goals and standards to it. Um, it allows me to gain massive amounts of information, you know, to like, even if there's a topic I'm not up on, like, let's say I was in Congress, right? And like, you know, something happens with a country I've never heard on, you know, give me a week, I'll read three books on it. You know, I, I can I can dive in and I can learn quickly. Um, I think that's an asset. And it's one that I try to bring to, you know, like my employees as a boss, you know, for my business, I try to bring it to my family, uh, to my friend circles. I, you know, I work out, you know, I'll help people in my networking group do public speaking or writing or something like that. I, like I said, all of these powers per se, for me, they're a responsibility. If I can identify them, speak clearly about them and then share them with other people, that's what I'm all about. How are you going to make those fundraising calls if you're studying for a whole week? <laughs> you see, my, my thought process is eventually someone will see the value in our power and they'll just, you know, do that for us. <laughs> one day, one day. One day. So communication, focus, and then uh, go back to... Sorry. Um, empathy. Empathy. How do you feel about that? A lot. <laughs> I feel a lot. <laughs> it's, I mean, I don't know, like... It, it's hard to say, like, I have no idea what other people feel, right? Like, mm -hmm. I can only feel what I feel. We talk about it all the time. But all I know is sometimes I look different than other people when we speak. Like, I am the guy that's tearing up, you know, talking about either something happy or sad, you know, and, you know, sometimes I just feel crushed by bad things that happen in the world, like they happen to me. And I have no control over how I feel over that. It It's not great. Um, but I don't know. I feel like it's been a strength. It definitely helps me connect with people, um, because I can typically find something that will relate us. And that's always good for, you know, building stories, learning. I mean, there's no greater knowledge than talking to another person realistically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like in order to communicate, there has to be that connection, that uh, protocol, if you will. Um, yeah. you know, we talk about manners and stuff. Manners is just a protocol for, how do you set up that first interaction so that you can kind of judge someone out, figure someone out, get it ready. And then you can have the conversation and that empathy is, is so important to um, being able to eventually communicate your ideas because uh, there's like that trust. And even if it's not just like, uh, I agree with you hundred percent, but um, you know, if you give someone uh, if you, if you lead, if you will, and so you give ground a little bit, people will respond and reciprocate. And again, that's something that's so missing in our discourse and in our politics It's of the idea of giving a little with the hope to, to get a little. Well, I mean, and it, you know, the way that I think about it sometimes is like, it's sometimes it's not even about giving a little to get a little. It's like maybe giving a little because that's what's fair, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. we, in what world do we get everything that we want? I always, when it comes to this type of like power, I always come back to Calhoun. And Madison, of course, and I, in my, we talked about it in our representation, power meets power, bigger, 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 bang. Ambition meets ambition or counteracting ambition. It can go either way. Like maybe you build more power or maybe you like undercut the power. Mm -hmm. Right. And the thing with, uh, you know, growing power over and over again, is just, I lost my train of thought, John. I just, I, you know, just slipped my mind. No, I, I think you're right. It, it, just because you give a little doesn't it never means you're supposed to always get something. Like sometimes it's just being like that, that social virtue that we talked about in the other class. Like sometimes you just have to forgive someone and not expect anything bad of it because it's better for you and it's better for them. I, I think I made the, the um, analogy of the eye for an eye. Like, you know, just because someone took out your eye, maybe it's better for everyone if you don't take out their eye and you just kind of, you let yeah. it go, you know? Well, and so now I remember is, is the compromise thing. And, mm -hmm. and Calhoun is part of these compromises, right? But like, what is really compromising when you didn't actually compromise the thing that you wanted to compromise, mm -hmm. right? Like if it, if the 
if the issue was over slavery and you held strong to preserve maintain and expand slavery where did you compromise right no, yeah. other than the fact that you created all these other arguments around it so you could compromise on those and keep the one that you want mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah no i see that i mean that's a lot of people get very invested in uh issues and i, I think that's going to be the big fight like over abortion and stuff because i think that there is a desire for some kind of compromise on that and it's uh, I imagine people will will have their own little structures and be like, oh, yeah, I, I'm giving you this, you know, but I'm not going to give you this. And you know, I mean, I the, think... the compromise is kind of already there by going to the states. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's almost the compromise. It's like, all right, it's not federally legal anymore or, you know, protected. So now each state can decide and you guys can figure it out. I mean, it's. Just think about it. And I know like so many people grew up with this, but it is legalized ending of life. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I can't get around how government supports that and protects that. Um, obviously it doesn't anymore at the federal level, but even at the state level, it, it, it does bother me. Um, I know there's a lot of arguments out there of, oh, it's better for humanity. Da, da, da. Like, I just don't like any argument that says ending life is good, just kind of it doesn't sit well with me. I'm a father of five. I'd have more kids if I could afford it, right? Like there's just so much joy in knowledge and being a father and expanding and, and sharing your life with others that I don't know, like maybe you're telling people that it's the right thing. Maybe your people are ending life when they don't realize that that is the, that's their life. Like it is literally an extension of yourself when you have a child and you're choosing to end that. I just, I don't, I don't know. We're getting off topic now. I'm getting, yeah, off. getting off topic. Sorry. Sorry. People are going to like be writing the show. Not that anybody would write the show, but. <laughs> First time for everything. They can put a note. They can put a sub stack note in there. Yeah. So. That'll be our most popular show. It's the one that Jeff gets canceled. <laughs> happens to everyone. It happens to everyone. So, um, and then thought. You have the uh, focus, empathy, and thought. I know what I mean, again, this was like a weakness for most of my life. My brain doesn't stop, man. Like I don't, I sleep two, three hours a night. Well, maybe three, four hours a night. I struggle to go to bed because like, I'm just running through everything in my head. I play things back. Um, an issue, I something I hear from people when I talk sometimes is like, you know, I just can't think about that anymore. And I go, I can, like- <laughs> <laughs> I can keep on thinking about it. I can think about it from all different angles. Like, let's go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that maybe I'm just different. I don't know. Like, or maybe I just enjoy it. Like that. Maybe that's just something that I enjoy to do. I love to think about things. Like I tell you, I will take time in my car. I don't listen to music. I just think um, some days when I'm having a rough day, I go upstairs, go to my bathroom. Cause it's the only place that I can get away from my children, you know, banging on the door to get a hold of me. And I just like sit there and I think I'm like, what is going on with this issue that I'm dealing with right now? That's pretty good. I like the uh, not listening to stuff in the car. Um, and, and just like not listening in, in general and having the time to pause and reflect. It's good. Yeah. Well, the pausing and reflecting, that that's new for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I think we talked about this before. Like, and we talked about it on Friday. But like, uh, it's definitely, you, you've got the, the temperaments of a melancholic where you just... You sit there and you try to figure out all, all the angles and um you know that's ha having that self-awareness uh makes it a superpower rather than a, a detriment because you can kind of understand like um myself I'm, I'm pretty phlegmatic where you try to be a people pleaser um and i've i think over the past year or so i've been realizing more um that i kind of have to be a little bit more aggressive and maybe not so much of a people pleaser um Especially if you're like, it's like this is what one of the things that came from me after running for Congress. Like, um, I kind of had this idea, like, oh, people don't want to be people don't want to be bothered and stuff. So, I'm not really gonna like talk to them about the campaign or tell them I'm running. And like, if it comes up, I'll, I'll put it out there. But I do have to be a little, you know, if you're running for something, you really have to be more like, hey, uh, I'll do the the Jeff Mayhew way. Like, do you know that there's an election? Do you know who's running? I'm one of those <laughs> people. Let me tell you about myself. You know, like, you know. Not being, you know, there's a, the, that balance, but also being more like forthcoming, like, hey, I'm going to try to like bring this into the conversation because I really want you to know about it, but I can do it in a way that's not going to be like, 
I'm some sleazy consultant or sleazy politician that's just trying to glad hand and get a vote. You know, I'm I'm trying to communicate and uh, be empathetic and, and figure that out. So. I mean, I don't know what you're doing at the door, John, but when I'm at the door, I'm knocking and I'm like, hey, we got to lock somebody up. First thing in the door, I don't tell them who though, right? Because I'll let them fill that in. They'll decide who to lock up and then I know where to go, right? It's like, don't we need to send somebody to prison and you know depending on what color they're wearing they're like yeah it's hillary yeah it's trump and i'm like all right cool i know how to talk to you now <laughs> no you really say that I was gonna... no absolutely not why would i say that because <laughs> it could be really effective you know you could really you could really gate you could get someone really quickly I would be I would be engaging people in a way that I don't want to engage people. That is not the direction I want uh, the Madisonian Republicans to go. I want a little bit more like thoughtful, you know, niceties. Let's put it that niceties, way. We're yeah. not, I'm, we're about civility and understanding, not locking people up. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> civility, decorum, all those kind of things. So, you know, the old Republican virtues. You know, mm -hmm. the the things that our our government was founded on. So what is your uh let's let's what are you doing on like what's a John Beatty typical week? Like what's your week light? Just so the people out there understand a little bit more about who you are. Um so I work at this school and that's my main job. Uh and I would say that takes up 40 plus hours plus I, it's an hour away so I'm in the car usually for an hour there, hour back. Um so it's uh that was one challenge running for Congress because it's in Maryland. So I, I'm, I was outside the district, so I couldn't meet with people as much, but it's, um, you know, for me, it's a lot of uh, fixing people's problem and trying to be like a servant to uh, those who are serving others. Um, so uh, it's honestly 80% printers, uh, sometimes yeah. the phones, sometimes the internet. Um, and then because I'm trying to make people's lives better and I've got this programming ability, I, end up building little bits of software and, and such. So I, I have this hobby um, student information system that's better than anything on the market because it like for our school, because it fits exactly the needs of our school. But, you know, I couldn't really sell it to any other school because I would say there's not many schools like ours. So um, that's that's what I do. And then I've, I've got um, this side gig of being on the Latin County School Board. So there's a bunch of meetings every week. Like I got a meeting tomorrow night uh, again, to talk about collective bargaining, since the school board authorized that. And then I got a meeting the next day to talk about um, the charter schools and the special programs that the county does. And then yeah, every other week, there's the, the big kahuna, the one you see on Fox News, where it's like an eight-hour school board meeting. Um, and then um, I'm trying to do this, start to, uh, trying to, another thing I learned in the campaign is that if I want to, like, keep going in politics, I really got to, like, free up my time, where... I get paid um, and I, so I can support my family. I got, you know, not like a billions and billions of dollars, but just like being able to support a family, but also having the flexibility to not have to show up to a job, jobby job. And, uh, and I can actually like really take time to go out in the community and meet people where they are rather than trying to have them come to where I am. So I'm trying to do this a couple of software projects with my brother. Um, and so we actually have this one thing that's going to start soon. Um, some kind of, uh, uh, how would you describe it? Like a Yelp for truckers, if you will. And apparently like the guy who's, who's kind of working with us, he's like, people will pay money for this. So that's, you know, that's <laughs> I don't think anyone pays any money for Yelp. So, um, so like that's, that's going to take up some, some cycles. And then the Madison Republicans takes up some cycles because we're, uh, there's kind of an impetus to do some reading and researching, um, which I like audiobooks are great for, because I can do that in the car. Um, we're trying to, to write when I can, um, which uh, I, th I think that's the, the tough thing about the help desk job really is because there isn't a set schedule. So I can't just be like, all right, I can sit down for an hour and focus on this and nothing, nothing's going to go right because maybe something will go wrong. So like, I think that's a challenge with, with my job right now is, is um, I can't just set aside, like I'm going to work for two hours and no one's going to talk to me. It'll be great. It's, I got to kind of be there. And some people come by my office and they're like, Hey, do you have a stapler? And, that's your thing again, right? Sorry, it's the choice thing again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wrecks your uh, concentration and focus. Yeah, um, and then the other like eighty percent of my life is is my family. Like we've got uh, six children, a seventh on the way in June, 
Um, and so uh, we're kind of near the end of that particular cycle where the baby's going to be here in seven weeks, uh, probably at the latest. And we'll see what the summer yields to that. But it's, you know, you know, it's a lot of kids is a lot of work. That I mean, not a lot of work. It's just things you yeah, got to think about. Yeah, it's a lot about. of work. Things you got to think about. Um, it's a so lot it, of work. But it scales. It scales. That's what it is. Um, yeah. You got to train your employees, John. That's right. <laughs> and then when they say, when you ask the employees to unload the dishwasher and they say, no. <laughs> then, you know, you, gotta you know, that's why. Correct, have... Got a corrective plan right there going. You got to, you know, figure out the, talk to HR about that. And just watch out or they'll unionize, John. <laughs> oh, man. That's, that's why I keep them off of Twitter. You know, once you get on Twitter, they learn about unions and oh man so, what's your i mean like what do you do i do always i know you do a lot of reading but i also know you run a business and i can't imagine that's uh a, a small amount of time and, and attention <sighs> yeah so i have a um so it's a custom apparel business i started it when i was 19 with my best friend from high school um we had worked at a local place that had done it and we wanted to be a sporting goods store. Like we were working together at a country club and we decided to open this up from advice from other business owners. We're like, yeah, it's going to be a lot of money to open a sporting goods store. You should do this thing first and then you could be a sporting goods store later. Once we got into it, we realized there was no point. Like everything in the market was going towards online sales. Mm -hmm. um, brick, large brick and mortar sporting goods stores weren't uh, going to do so well. So we we just stuck with our our business model that we had. We expanded. We have uh, we do embroidery and screen printing in house. I've always been like design focused. So like the part of the way that like we competed in the market originally was like I would just do designs for free. Everybody mm -hmm. else charged for them. But that's like if you're a laborer, you know that's the easy way to cut the you know cut the cost yeah. and like compete in the market is you you discount your labor. You're doing work for free. So um, I did that a lot. As I scaled and got bigger, I would start to charge for artwork, but I would still give it away for free to like volunteer organizations, schools, churches, stuff like that. And uh, now we're we're at a section, a part where like I've kind of like reshaped the company a little bit, rebranded it. It's called Hard Hits Community Branding, focusing more on that design work. Um, I wrote this design guide. Believe it or not, I wrote it as a communication guide because design is a form of communication. Yes, um, that way I can take my customers through like, you know, it's like communication through imagery. So if you want a good design, the first thing you got to know is what do you want to say and who do you mm -hmm. want to say it to? And then after that, like for my industry, you got to make sure you get a, to get a good design. It's all about spacing, right? So there's different shapes that eat like apparel comes on. So we frame the design in the shape that it is, whether it's square, rectangle, vertical, horizontal, whatever. Um, and then we size it. So you go through those process and then we set the tone. And the tone is, again, it's back to color is a big thing in the screen printing industry. Digital printing has convinced a lot of people that having a lot of colors on your shirt somehow makes you special. But all it does is it washes away your message. Mm -hmm. So like I explain color as again, communication, it's like active or it's passive, it's fun or it's serious, right? And so like you pick a tone and then at the end of the day, now we've got what you're trying to say, who you're trying to say it to, what you're going to put it on and like what type of like messaging are you going with? Serious, fun, whatnot. And then we design for you. Um, so I, I build stuff like this for my company. Um, I train my employees. I typically go into the office Depending on the, the week, between seven and eight thirty. Um, depending on you know if I'm dropping a kid off at school or whatnot, mm -hmm. and I'll be there till minimum noon. Uh, most weeks, most days, two o'clock. But I to, I take a lot of meetings, right? So I'm typically just in the office for meetings and for like you know with my staff and and whatnot. Um, I've got a really great staff that. You know, I've got a production manager in the Mac that takes care of all the screen printing. I've got an office manager that oversees the embroidery department and the front office. I'm able to just kind of facilitate things and trust that they're going to take care of my customers. And, you know, what I tell people is like, when you're printing their shirt, look at it. Would you wear it? 
<laughs> and if the answer is no, then we need to fix that, right? Yeah. And like, and, and I mean, it's how I tell people is like, just treat it like it's yours. Like if it's yours, you know, if if you're happy with it and they don't like it, then just explain to them like why you're happy with it. And then like, so a lot of times people just like don't understand. And like, if you tell them like, hey, this is why I did this thing. They're like, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. Now I like it. Or mm -hmm. maybe they still disagree with you. And that's okay. Like, we're not always going to see to eye to eye. We can fix mistakes when they happen. But um, so that that's a lot of my time, obviously, hard hits. Um, I'm the founder of the Madisonian Republicans. I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, if I leave at 12 or I leave at two, I'm pretty much taking a meeting for the Madisonians at that point. Um, we're going to a networking meeting. Um, and then I'm coming home and I'm writing or reading, depending on what it is, spending time with the kids when they get off the bus, taking care of dinner, and then back to politics and parenting writing or Madisonian writing or something like that. Um, that's pretty much my life, you know, like it's just work and kids and wife and I try to find the balance. And sometimes I get off and like, you know, I'll Hey, Hey John, you want to go out to dinner? Let's not talk about politics. And about 20 minutes in John's like, Hey, remember, uh, we're not supposed to be talking about politics. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, it was my fault too. Cause I, I started it. It was Katie's fault. <laughs> she, she brought, she brought it up. No, <laughs> I'll blame anybody, but me. Good. That's a, that's a good politician right there. Speaking of <laughs> locking people up and blaming everyone but yourself. That's, <laughs> that's a I've become too a key. monster. <laughs> uh, and then demanding people fund, uh, give you donate to you. This because again, because you need the money to lock people up and to um to blame other people. It's a fact. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's hard to go out and not talk about politics. Like politics is kind of like life and you know, considering that I have two organizations kind of that are centered around politics, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard. Like, what else am I talking about? Like, well, I don't do anything else. I miss fantasy football. I used to have a lot of fun on fantasy football. I don't I don't get to watch anymore. I've been trying to make some trades lately. I haven't been able to get anything done, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like sports could take a lot of time. Like, Oh, my God. I used to waste so much time on fantasy football. Let me tell you, like. The focus thing that I was talking about, like that hyper focus that like I use as an asset that used to be devoted to fantasy football. And let me tell you, that drove my not, my wife nuts. OK, because I would disappear for like a whole weekend. I wouldn't be I'd be in the house just on my phone on a fantasy football draft and just like I'd be up in the you know, that whole not sleeping thing that makes it really great for somebody like me in a like a what do they call those? I can't remember the type of draft it is, but like we had these online drafts, uh, auction drafts, mm -hmm. and we had like the set times for like the cutoffs would be at like 2 a.m. And I'm like, Psh, I'm up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> You're always, uh, you know, skirting the rules, playing as close to the chest as you can just to, to get that little bit of advantage over your competition. And uh, yeah, I was... Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's actually a lot like politics. I got to tell you, your friends are going to lie to you and you're going to like, mm, no, I know. I know you want that guy. I know. <laughs> Cause it's, I mean, like it's horse trading and uh, I want to say politics is a lot of horse trading. You know? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and uh, trying to like compromise without compromising. Yeah. It's not really compromising if you got everything you wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, I, See, the, the idea of compromising is to understand that everything that you want is not necessarily right. You know, like you have to have that humility in a situation to be like, look, I can't possibly be right about everything. I'm just a man, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that, that you uh, you need something. Like the, the compromise isn't necessarily, in that sense, not getting something that you want, but realizing that you didn't want it in the first place and it wasn't good for you. Is that... Is that what you would? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you just don't know. Maybe you just like out of the blue, you know, like <clears throat> I think about some of the things that, uh, you know, get debated sometimes in Congress. And I got to think like these people, how could they really know? They live so far away from the problem, you mm -hmm. know, but I don't know, well, maybe like a more diverse, larger, you know, house would be uh, solve that problem. I don't know. It's just an idea.
with just a couple more seats. Just a, you know, I don't know, like maybe 435 more seats at minimum. <laughs> I bet they could do it. Um, no, it, it reminds me of this, like this is Steve Jobs quote and, you know, who knows where, if it's really him or just, but it's, um, you got to have uh, strong opinions loosely held. And I think like, that's not that you compromise on your principles. Like, again, this is opinions, but that just means like you come into there, you say like, this is what I know. This is what I think on this situation. And I want to really like stand and defend it. And then someone can come along and say like, no, you're wrong for this X, Y, and Z. And you say, oh, I can see that. And then you, you change your opinion. And then you, again, you hold on to another strong opinion. And I think um, we, we end up uh, conflating like truth and sort of, you know, principles or something like these are things that I hold dearly with like mm -hmm. opinions on a topic and stuff. And I think like you could take taxation policy, like I, I would say that there's very few like principles in there. And even like the econ economists don't seem to know all that much or like think things change and economic theory um, doesn't, it has to catch up with it. But like, there's a lot of, of strongly held opinions in there that basically people will not bend on and not yield on one bit. Like, I think the, there's the, um, the Grover Norquist, like I'm never going to tax pledge that you could take if you're a congressional candidate. Like, Honestly, that's so stupid because you can go in there and say, like, I'd really like to to not raise taxes and stuff, but how the heck are we going to pay down this uh, what thirty trillion dollar debt we've got? Like, the money's got to come from somewhere, and since no one wants to cut spending, it's probably going to have to come from taxation. Like, you know, that's again like some principle. Like, you could you can find the principles in there. You can have strong opinions on it, but you can also uh, give them up when when you need to. So you know, it would be uh, so. Here's what we do. All right you get rid of a lot of taxes okay especially taxes mm -hmm. on like payroll taxes car taxes property taxes and, and all the i think the like the loopholes on them too i think like the the whole complications make it worse and then you you got to set like a, a flat tax at some point right but you don't have to do it right off the bat right like it can be an objective down the road so you get rid of those taxes you lower the minimum wage you encourage people to hire people into the marketplace what does that do it creates more tax revenue, right? Mm -hmm. The tax revenues that's left there, the income tax. So you're by you're getting rid of the those taxes, and what you do that money, the property tax, the in, um, the car tax, and the uh, what did I say, the payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. Now businesses have money to pay their employees more money, right? Those employees can then use that money in the marketplace to continue to buy things, which generates more tax revenue, right? So like. By not eliminating all the taxes and eliminating right. some that would be job, you know, job. I hate this idea, job creators. No, you're mm -hmm. just cre you're just allowing opportunity to happen, right? Exactly. Like yeah. job creators are out there. Just let us create. Stop taxing us, you know. Like that's how you solve the problem, or well, that's how I see it at least. John. Pretty strong. This is pretty strong opinion you got there. I got a really strong opinion, but you know what? I'm willing to listen to others on it, you know, like maybe come, come at me with something different. Maybe, maybe you have a better idea, but you know what? I won't yield on my principles that I won't yield on. We have some principles, don't we, John? We do have some principles. We'll talk about it in a meeting. On That's April right. We, I'm really happy with these. So uh, for, for those of out there that don't know, Craig is a member of our group and he, uh, he came up with these principles and I thought they were fantastic. I'm really excited about them. We'll, uh, be a little insert if you come to the packet uh come to the uh the meeting on saturday and you can have you can see like what do we stand for what it, you know madisonian republicans are talking about compromise i don't know guys i don't know if i like this compromise word what are you going to stand for isn't that in the the hamilton if, mm -hmm. what do you stand for well we'll tell you what we stand for april 22nd not to know if you end up listening to this after april 22nd you can come May 20th, that's another thing would change the date for the, the May meeting. So April 22nd, May 20th, Giuseppe's in Haymarket. 4 to 6 p.m. 4 to 6 p.m. That's right. RSVP, please. Like, come on. Give us give us a hand here. It's just good manners. It's good protocol. <laughs> it's good manners. You got to know how much bruschetta to order, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, you know, I was thinking what I want to do, John, and I actually approached, uh, I talked about this a little bit with some people today, is I want to write a parenting class on over with communication for children on the concept of the active, active, passive, passive, 
and then layer it over the four ten tenets that God gave us, right? Temper, temperaments. Temperaments. I'm sorry. Yeah. What did I say? I don't know. Tenants. I'm I'm tired, John. He gave us he gave us ten ten tenants, <laughs> and they've been banned from the public square. <laughs> But I want to do that. I want to like layer it over. I want to like put on classes for our community. You know, like the one thing like actually got... that'd be that'd be great because this is the the thing that every time Katie and I have someone over for dinner, we just kind of like start talking about it and we we change people's lives, people's lives. But the uh, the thing that like I get from my kids, you know, I've got middle schoolers and I've got elementary schoolers, and they come home and the stories they tell me makes me think that kids are struggling out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I talk to a lot of parents and I, it's not like I talk to parents that have just like, are just bad people who are raising bad kids. I talk to parents who like really just need help, you know, realistically, I mean, dealing with the whole COVID shutdown, like that's a whole challenge of parenting that nobody was prepared for and nobody mm -hmm. knew how to take care of that. And so now you're like, you're out of this situation and now your kids are dramatically altered by this like massive upheaval of regular society and it's like yeah. what do you do now you know the kids are fighting in the bathroom writing bad words everywhere you know the the educators are quitting left and right because they just can't take the bad behavior and meanwhile you got parents that are looking for help and they got nobody to go to so i don't know i'm that's one of the things that i'm working on the side uh i'm going to be doing for the next few weeks trying to come up with that i'd love to be able to put a class on either in a church or just in the community somewhere, of course, free, you know, for as many people. And then, I don't know, train some other people to teach, you know, because like what we were talking about Friday and Katie brought it up is once you understand like where, where your child fits in, you can kind of better guide them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you, it's the power meaning power or power with a net, right? Depending on your child is where you're going to meet them. Yeah. The high to guide, guide them. So and if you if you meet the wrong child with the wrong power, then you just create a bigger problem. Right. It's a power struggle. Everything uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, a whole episode on power, John. Crazy. This lead up to the uh the class you can expect. So if you like this, it'll get better. And if you didn't like this, it'll get better. <laughs> come on. This, so like is power something that you've always thought about? No, definitely not. Yeah, me either. Like, I literally never thought about power until, I mean, even after, I didn't really think about power as much until, like, even after I was running for Congress, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Before then, it was always, like, nuts and bolts, like, you know, government structure, stuff like that. It wasn't until I got, you know, into the campaign and I really started to get you know, the side turn that you get from politicians where they like smile to your face and they tell you everything you want to hear. Then they slowly drift mm -hmm. off and oh, never to return or follow through on their promises. When I kept on getting that over and over again, I was like, something's going on here. You know what I call that? I call that passive power. <laughs> Which you can find out more. April 22nd at Giuseppe's. That's right. Um, so yeah, so... April 22nd, we're going to have the sphere of power. We've got a couple candidates that have said they were going to come. They have an RSVP'd. So, uh, you know, just not trying to throw their name out. We do have, uh, speaking of candidates, uh, segue, next week on the show, John, do you know we have a, can a local candidate coming on the show? Who is it? It is Robert Rufolio. Rufolo. I'm going to have to ask him how Rufolo. to pronounce his name. I should have asked that already, right? That's the first question. He should I have just, you know, he should have just changed his name before he started running. Like, that's really, it's on him. Really, well, his, his name looks really close to Rufio, and I was a big Peter Pan fan, so I just, you mm. know, I get it confused in my mind. But anyways, he's running for state senate in district number 30. That's my district. Um, I got a chance to meet him. I've, of course, I've met, like, all the candidates. Uh, <laughs> and so he's going to be on the show next week. Um, so that's exciting. And, you know, I just want to say, I, I keep on running into the candidates out in the community, pretty much everywhere I go, I run into them. And what I'll say is, if you're a citizen in this district where I live in Virginia, what I can tell you is there are a bunch of candidates running for office who are willing to listen to you. You got to go find them though. And that's the biggest struggle. 
Um, you come to our meeting, we're going to talk about how you find them. Um, you come to our meeting, we're going to talk about how you communicate with them. And you know what? They might even be there for you to talk to. And that's the most important part is to be able to talk to your power, talk to your representative. That's really what we're trying to get across to people. So uh, April 22nd at Giuseppe's, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, you can RSVP at madisonianrepublicans.com. Come on out. We'll talk about the House's power. We'll talk about the Senate's power. We'll talk about the executive, the judiciary, and all those other powers like the PACs, the media, the parties, and the corporations that have an effect on our society. We'll talk about how we manage them, how we work through them, how we've gotten off track, and how we can get back on track. Um, so it's going to be a really great time. We hope to see you there. Um, we'll have some bruschetta. You can order some drinks if you want. Just you know, remember, it is a classroom environment, so be kind. <laughs> John, anything to add before we... Uh, wrap this episode we just will look forward to seeing you on saturday absolutely all right peace and love <laughs>